thank you so much again for being here with us online. One of our favorite things to do every week is to think about you and to be able to worship together. If you've got your copy of God's Word, we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 6 today. 1 Timothy chapter 6. You know, the earliest record of boxing goes back to 3, 3 B.C. Before Jesus was on the scene, men were duking it out in a contest or in sports, from bare knuckles to the modern-day boxing glove, boxing is where one man or one woman imposes their will upon another. And it's interesting to think that you walk into a ring and with only your fists, you're able to knock one down or knock one out or try to avoid being knocked down or knocked out. You know, each boxer tries to come to the ring with a different strategy. Maybe they've got a favorite punch, or maybe they're lighting their feet, or maybe they think, you know, if I can just endure to the next round, to the next round, to the next round, I will be able to win the contest. Whatever their strategy is, it's meant to help them go the distance. You know, the distance refers to the number of rounds in a boxing match. And we, we've heard the phrase, go the distance, but in boxing, it means that a fighter goes the entire bout without being knocked out. You see, as believers, we need to be prepared for battle. There is a fight in our lives, and I'm convinced that many of us might be getting knocked down. We might be even worse getting knocked out. We might be trained to box spiritually, but the truth of the matter is many of us struggle when it comes to the battle. Some of us struggle to hit the target. Some of us struggle to endure the fight but I believe we're all called to go the distance. And, and that's exactly what Paul is going to remind his young protege in Timothy. To fight the good fight. To go the distance. You know, earlier in Ephesians, Paul reminds us that the battle that we fight is not against flesh and blood, but it is against evil. It is against the enemy. It's against sin. It's a spiritual battle that we fight. And when we as believers stand up and we duke it out, we give glory to the Lord. But when we choose not to fight, or when we choose to get knocked down and not get back up again, it hurts our witness. And it minimizes our impact of the kingdom of God. And that's what Paul was telling Timothy. The early church struggled to keep fighting well. They were not fighting the good fight. Many were getting knocked down, or many worse were throwing in the towel. And so Paul, as he's thinking about his young protege, Timothy, he reminds him at the end of his first letter, hey, fight the good fight of faith. Be prepared for action. Go the distance. And I think that's the question for us this morning. Are you prepared to go the distance? This morning, we're going to look at going the distance requires flight, requires fight, and it requires faith. Again, if you've got your copy of God's Word, we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Find yourself in verse 11. And Paul says this, But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Let's pray together. Father, by your grace and by your mercy, we thank you for your word. Help us, whether we're at home or whether we're right here, to listen, to be obedient, and to follow you. And in Christ's name that we pray, amen. So going the distance requires flight. Now, and I know what you're thinking. How do we fight the good fight? We have to flight instead of fight? That's exactly what Paul says. Paul says you must flee. Look back at verse 11. But for you, O man of God, flee. That's his first instruction to fighting the fight, is to flee. Now, I'm going to let you know something, that the, the Greek word for flee means to flee means to leave. means to get out of Dodge. It means to go away, to retreat. Don't stand there, but get out of there. 
Flee from what? Well, it says here in verse 11 to flee from these things. We don't know what these things are right here in verse 11, so we have to take a look into the context. If you were to back up into verse 3 all the way through verse 10, you're going to see a couple of things that Paul tells Timothy to flee. One of those things is don't crave spiritual or uh, church divisions. Don't get caught up in controversy. You know from history that in the early church at this time, debate was a big deal. And there were a lot of young, arrogant, and ignorant believers who felt like they could become teachers. And in their desire to have a platform to teach, sometimes they were teaching false religion or or even worse, false doctrine. And as a result, it was causing division. It was considerable issue in the early church. And so Paul reminds Timothy, don't crave that. When you crave that argument or that debate, it creates division. So don't look for that. Rather, flee. Flee from those silly controversies and those myths, those debates, because they cause division. He also says don't crave material possession. Those false teachers would often use the debate platform for financial Gain. They were using God to get what they wanted. And so Paul's big warning to Timothy is don't crave wealth. Don't be tempted by materialism. In fact, he says the love of money is a root of evil. Not that money in itself is evil, but the love of money, the passionate pursuit of money is a snare and a trap. And so Paul reminds Timothy, don't get caught up in that. Jesus says it this way in Matthew chapter 6, Don't collect yourselves treasures on earth, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So Paul tells him, flee from these cravings, from these temptations. Don't be distracted by controversy or coin or debate or denarii or arguments or wealth. He reminds them that going the distance requires a sense of flight. Now, I've I've got a heavy bag right here with me, and we have this heavy bag in my garage. I've got three sons. We use this bag as a stress reliever. In fact, I tell them, go take your stress out on the bag, not on each other. I'm not a boxer. I don't float like a butterfly or sting like a bee, but I enjoy throwing a punch every now and then. But I can hit this thing as hard as I want, And it helps me be stronger in knowing how to throw a punch. But there's one thing this heavy bag doesn't do. It never punches back. It doesn't really train me on how to avoid a punch. You see, a good boxer isn't just concerned with knowing how to throw a punch. A good boxer learns how to avoid a punch. And I think the same is true for us as believers. We have to learn how to avoid getting hit how to avoid the things that we're tempted with or sin or temptation in our life. You know, we have to be thoughtful as believers to really consider how to be lighter in our feet. And that doesn't come natural for us. We have to be very thoughtful about learning how to avoid the trap and the snare of temptation and sin. We've got to learn how to dodge, how to dip, how to how to get out of the way, because that's exactly what Paul tells Timothy. And it's a great encouragement to us to fight the good fight. We've got to learn flight. We can't go toe-to-toe with sin, not on our own. I I love the Rocky movies. And And if you're familiar with Rocky Balboa, he's a boxer. And in the movies Rocky, one of the things he does toward the end of the movie is he sticks his chin out and he encourages his opponent to hit him harder and even hit him more and in the idea of the movie it encourages Rocky and it kind of gets him riled up so that he has the strength to knock out his opponent but in real life we would never do that we would never say hey take your best shot you'll get knocked out but we as believers often do that with sin we don't avoid sin well sometimes in fact we stick our our chin out and we say you know I can handle you and then before we know it we're on the ground spiritually emotionally. And we have to be cognitive and thoughtful about how we need to avoid sin. Listen, if you struggle with alcohol, don't drive by the liquor store on the way home. If you struggle with gossip, don't get Facebook. If you struggle with materialism, you need to make sure you're not on Amazon late at night so you're not buying things. Those are 
somewhat silly, but the truth of the matter is, if you have a sin that you're struggling with, you need to learn how to avoid it. Flight is the key to fighting the good fight. In the second letter, Paul tells this to Timothy, flee the youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Paul says, run away. And that idea is a continual idea. It's not a, one, a run away one time. It's continually learn how to avoid, how to flee, how to flight, if you will, away from sin. So a question I have for you today, the question I've wrestled with this week for me, is what sin am I trying to go toe-to-toe with? Like a good boxer, I need to be agile and fluid and flexible and get out of the way of those punches. You, spiritually, need to learn how to get out of those out of the way of the evil that's coming or the temptation that's coming your way. You know, but Jesus reminds us that he's provided a way out. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. There is no temptation has overtaken you that is not uncommon to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond what your ability is, but with the temptation he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. I love the scripture. To endure the sin, we have to find the escape. He has provided it. We've got to find it. Don't go 12 rounds with sin. Don't try to get in the ring with temptation. Rather, learn how to escape it, that you might be able to endure it. If you don't flee, you're going to get hit. And we all know people, people we never would have thought had to experience the consequences of sin that found themselves experiencing a knockout because they didn't avoid or didn't practice getting out of the way of sin. So fighting the good fight is knowing when to have flight and avoid the punches. This is Paul's first instruction to Timothy on how to fight this good fight of faith. But going the distance doesn't just require flight, it also requires fight. Going the distance requires fight. At the end of verse 11, it says this, to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. If there is an instruction to flee, his next instruction is to pursue. This intentional pursuit, it's it's as if you're running swiftly to catch somebody or something. So to fight the good fight of faith, you must find yourself in pursuit. Pursuit of what? Well, Paul lays it out here, pursuit of of six things. Very quickly and very simply, one of those is righteousness. It's a reference to the actions that are morally right and good. It's the right thing at the right time, the right way. Pursue righteousness. Then it goes on to say to pursue godliness. Actions that line up with the character of God. Very specific actions that indicate your passion for God. Now, there's a similarity between righteousness and godliness, and and, and a writer, Bruce Barton, writes this, that they overlap one another, but if righteousness focuses on obedience, doing the right thing, the right time, the right way, godliness focuses on the motive behind that obedience, that I desire to be so much like God that it's going to motivate me to behave the right way and into righteousness. So pursue, pursue those two things, pursue righteousness and pursue godliness. Pursue faith. A reference here to faith is a deeper trust with God. Some of us have jumped off the deep end for God. But we might not find ourselves running fast to trust him even more than we did the time before. Growing in faith means that we're willing to jump off a 30-story building into the deep end for God. Fighting the good fight means that we're fighting and pursuing a deeper trust with God. It's also about love, that we need to pursue love. Now, the word love here is agape love, God unconditional kind of love, that we're to pursue a greater affection for Jesus. John 15, 9 says to abide in his love, to run after a deeper and deeper love for Christ. That We're so in love with him. We have this great affection for him that it impacts how we live. I think a great indicator of our affection is the joy in our life. How joyful are you will determine and reflect how much affection you have for the Lord. Pursuing 
a godly good fight means that we're also pursuing steadfastness. Now, this is a specific, a very different word for us. It refers to patience under trial. In fact, it's a compound word in the Greek. And it says to remain and or to be under. And so it's meant to say that a man who remains strong and godly under trial to be a man of endurance in the midst of pain or in the midst of chaos. Then it reminds us that we must be gentle, pursuing gentleness, a gentle spirit. Picture of a man who remains calm. He's not aggressive. He's not angry. He's not bitter, but he is a gentle man, a humble man, a man with an attitude of, of humility in his life, like a man facing persecution who's unwilling to retaliate. Jesus is a great model of being a gentle man, that while he was persecuted on the cross, he looked down and reminded them, Father, do not, excuse me, Father, forgive them, for they, knew not, they know not what they do. That's the idea of being a gentle man. So to pursue means to run after, the best runners train to run. It, we won't just automatically pursue. We will have to train ourselves to pursue. <coughs> Excuse me. So no one ever starts a, a marathon without ever running the very first mile. We've got to be ourselves and find ourselves to be in training to pursue the fight, if you will. You know, a boxer has several different kinds of punches. They've got a jab, they've got a cross, they, they, they've got an uppercut, and in their repertoire of punches, they, they will may start out as a young boxer not knowing exactly how to make those punches happen. They may get confused and go, you know, my hook is not my cross, or I don't when to know how to do an uppercut. They may not make good contact, but the more that they punch, the more they begin to have some muscle memory, and they're able to be effective. And the more they punch, the, the faster they are. And the better, the better contact that they make. And so when Paul says, hey, I want you to be a man of good fight, that means you've got to pursue righteousness. And, and, and make sure that you're pursuing faith. And don't forget about love. And as young believers, we might not do great at learning how to put our trust in the Lord in deeper faith. But the more we punch the better aim we get, the faster we are, the stronger we are, and the more effective we are to fight. Sometimes we as believers, the longer we get in the Christ, maybe we might find ourselves getting more tired. We don't have the endurance that we like to have when it comes to throwing those punches of faith. But we've got to remind ourselves that even though we may get tired, the Lord provides the strength we need in order to fight well. Sometimes we as believers don't make great contact with our punches. Sometimes we're not as aggressive as we need to be. Sometimes we're out of practice. Wherever we are in this idea of fighting a good fight, we still must realize that to not fight is not an option. Paul doesn't say, you know what, if you feel like it, you should fight. Paul doesn't say, when it's easy, pursue these things. Paul says, fight. Paul says, pursue. Going the distance is not an option. So to go the distance, we must have flight. We must fight. And then last this morning, going the distance requires faith. It requires faith. Verse 12 says, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Now, faith here is not referring to salvation. It's not the kind of faith that draws us into a relationship with God. Faith here refers to our worldview, the, the Christian life, Christianity, our ethic. And so it's as if Paul is saying, fight the good fight for faith. I don't know if anyone else feels this way, but I certainly have felt this way the last several months. I feel like we're in a fight for our faith. I, I feel like our political and cultural climate is full of friction and full of tension, that our morals as believers are under attack and that our ethics are not being defined by scripture, but our culture and our political climate. 
You know, if history's taught us anything, that when culture or our politics determine what's right or wrong, destruction is not far off. You know, America is in the middle of an identity crisis right now. You can ask somebody who's wearing a red Make America Great Again hat and ask somebody who's holding up a Black Lives Matter protesting sign, hey, what do we need to do about America? And you're going to get wildly different answers. And one of the scary things for me as a pastor is that that tension isn't just out there. That tension is right here. It's in the church. It's among believers. And there are some who are so thoughtful and, and, and forceful about some political realities or social justice issues. And I think there's probably a little bit of truth everywhere. But we as believers need to take a step back and, and realize that our ethic shouldn't be determined by what's going on out there. That our ethic, our worldview, should be determined by what's happening in here. Writer Jonathan Lehman, in, in a book called How the Nations Rage, reminds us that we're concerning ourselves with American, and as an American, often we're determining how we read Scripture by our American worldview and not allowing Scripture to determine how we evaluate our principles as Americans. It's like a big pot of stew that's been simmering for centuries and centuries, and it, and it contains all of our favorite phrases. So as a Christian American, we, we know we ought to render to Caesar what is Caesar's. We, we know that we ought to be subject to the governing authorities. We know the idea of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that the wall of separation between church and state, that, that we believe the idea of of the people, by the people, for the people. We pledge allegiance to the flag and any God we trust. But the sacred lines of Scripture cooked together with the political lines of American history often flavor both sides. And I'm afraid that we as believers have forgotten that, trip, that Scripture trumps all. We can't allow our preference to get in front of the Word of God. We need to fight for this faith. We need to fight, not for social justice, or not for a political party, or not for us, or even our kids. We need to fight for something much greater than us, the Christian way. And that's what Paul says to Timothy. When we are fighting this good fight of faith, it's as if Paul saying to Timothy, listen, there's a lot of great pursuits out there, but we are fighting for the very fabric of our ethic and our worldview. Don't forget that. How long do we fight? We fight until Jesus returns. Later on in verses 13 and following, it reminds us that there's coming a time where Jesus is going to return, so fight for those faithful things. Fight for our ethic and our worldview until Jesus rings the bell until Gabriel blows his horn. Paul is saying, listen, go the distance. Once Jesus returns, the King of kings and the Lord of lords will make all things right. Once Jesus returns, the immortal one, the creator, the savior will make all things right. So fight until he comes back, until he rings that final bell. Go the distance. Paul Later on in 2 Timothy, reminds Timothy, listen, I want you not just to fight the good fight of faith, but I'm going to model that for you. In 2 Timothy 4, it says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. This is Paul. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Paul's telling Timothy, fight for faith. Take hold of the eternal life which you have in Christ Jesus. You are not alone. You have the ability to do it with others around you and certainly with the strength that God provides you. A couple of words of encouragement before we close today. Just some thoughts about some application. One, we don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. Jesus has conquered sin and death. We need to fight from there. We're not fighting to be right we're fighting for our faith in the victory that's already been done on the finished work of the cross. Fight from that perspective is key 
to fighting the good fight the right way, the right time, and to have a perseverance to fight until the very end, to go the distance. I think another thought of application this, this morning is training. How's your training going? Are you preparing to avoid sin? Are you preparing to be a better fighter? Are you preparing to fight for the faith of which I think God's called us all to as believers? Who's training you? Better yet, who are you training? Who are you training with? And how's the training going? If you've been a believer for quite some time, it may feel as if the training's a little stale and you get a little tired with your head knowledge. Find yourself pursuing righteousness, pursuing godliness, going deeper in your faith, going deeper in your love, having a a steadfastness that can't be understood, but being a gentle person, realizing that in Christ, we're not meant to be aggressors, but we're meant to be faithful. We're meant to be men and women who in our cultural and political climate aren't out to stab at or to poke fun at or to create controversies with, but rather we're called to be faithful, we're called to be gentle, we're called to help move forward the faith. And that may mean sometimes being quiet so that when the time is better, when the time is right, you speak up in the right way and at the right time. How's your training going? And secondly, or lastly, thirdly, I would say this, If you've been knocked down, it's time to get back up. If you've been knocked down, it's time to get back up. You know, in boxing, there's called a mandatory eight count. When when a fighter gets knocked down, the referee stops the bout, he counts to eight, and in that time of counting to eight, he's making a judgment call. He's, He's asking himself, can this fighter continue? And it's also an opportunity for the fighter to be able to clear their head, to be able to kind of get their wits about them again. And he's counting to eight. It's called a mandatory eight count. It's required by all referees in all boxing. Can I just tell you that Jesus Christ is a believer? He's your eight count. Can I just tell you that he's counting to eight? He's helping you get your wits about you, giving you an opportunity to clear your head and heart so that you might stand up and fight again. But unlike a referee in a boxing match, Jesus doesn't just count to eight. He may be continually counting, waiting for you, willing to help you for as long as it takes for you to get back up, for you to fight the good fight of faith. His intention is not for you to be knocked down or knocked out. His intention for you is to get up, shake off those cobwebs in your head and your heart, and swing away to fight for faith. Avoid the sin that's coming your way. Avoid those punches that are coming at you fast and hard, and learn how to throw a punch well by pursuing righteousness and godliness. Today, you may feel like you're in the eight count, but be reminded Jesus is there to help you go the distance.